Okay, hi everyone. This is uh, Danielle Karapkin speaking to you from the webyeshiva.org platform here in Thornhill, Ontario. Webyeshiva.org is, is an online yeshiva originating in Eretz Israel, in Israel, and we're delighted to be able to be a part of it. Uh, we are studying Moren Vuchim, Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed. Uh, we had completed uh, last week uh, in the middle of uh, chapter 10. We're going to our goal is uh, two chapters today, the concluding part of chapter 10 and all of chapter 11, which is a relatively small chapter. Um, where we are, let's get our bearings. The Rambam is trying to explain to us a system whereby man is given free will and therefore God, who is providential, is able to reward man for the good that he chooses and punish man for the evil that he chooses because man is placed in an environment where free will is granted to him and he is not inhibited in any way from his choices of good and evil. Um, and as such, the Rambam has been discussing with us the existence of evil in the world and how theologically, um, from the viewpoint of how can imperfection and flaw emanate from a perfect God, how is it possible that God can be responsible for evil? And so the Rambam in the first part of chapter 10 developed for us a thesis having to do with the idea of privation. In, in contrast with the Mutakalimun of his times, of the uh, another group of philosophers of his times, um, the Rambam believes that um, death is not a separate attribute that inheres within a human body or an animal body but rather it is simply the privation or the absence of life. Um, blindness is not a separate attribute, but rather it is the privation of sightedness. And in this kind of um, theology, the Rambam presents to us that God is never directly responsible for something that we as human beings perceive to be bad or deficient or painful to our condition. So uh, God is not directly responsible for the blindness of the blind man, but only uh, endows this world with material um, essence and matter is subject to corruption. And as a result, when matter breaks down, it causes deficiency and flaw. It's not God directly doing it, it's God indirectly doing it. Very interesting analogy that the Rambam had provided us with uh, on page 439 in the in the Pines edition, is that it's like if a person sees someone drowning and neglects to save them, we don't say that the that the person who was negligent uh, ended up killing the person, but indirectly caused that person's demise. In the same way, the Rambam is distancing any kind of negativity, um, negative attributes or negative consequences from God um, by saying that God is indirectly responsible for flaw and corruption and death and blindness and so forth and so on in this world. And so after all of that, the Rambam gets to the subject directly of what we call evil. And so I think it's important for us, um, I'm gonna share my screen today, and I'm going to have an important postscript to this whole discussion today. The, our just very short introduction, what does the word evil mean? In Hebrew, we have a word that is just two letters, ra. The shorish is resh, vav, ayin. Um, and it simply means anything that from a human perspective is something undesirable or painful. Now, it's interesting to note that the Radak, Rav David Kimchi, one of the medievalists, wrote a very important sefer called Sefer Hashorashim. And in describing this word ra, he says as follows, ki ra'a shetavo me'eta adam, o ra'a shetavo lo me'eta shemit barach. He says, whether that ra comes from human beings, or the ra comes from God himself, hakol ra'a ein hefresh b'neihem. It is all under the category of what we would call ra or ra'a in the feminine conjugation. Um, and what we translate it as it as is evil. 
but evil in the philosophical sense does not mean the man in the black cloak with the mustache. Evil means anything that from a human perspective is something undesirable or painful. So therefore, evil could be a person getting cancer. That's evil. That's evil existing within the world. Evil could also be human evil or human ra that we're going to discuss in chapter 11 in just a moment. But for our purposes, for this portion of chapter 10 that we're going to be discussing today, when the Rambam talks about evil, he really means the word ra, which, we, which doesn't align perfectly with the English word evil for us. And so we're just going to read mostly from the text today, but we're going to use our handout, which, by the way, as I always say, is available to download either from webyeshiva.org's website in our course description for today, or can be downloaded from the Facebook uh, community, Shi'ur in Moren Avuchim. So the Rambam says, based on everything that I've proposed up until now, that any kind of corruption or flaw is really a product of God's privation, not a direct um, uh, proactive consequence of God. For this reason, the following proposition may be enunciated, enunciated in an absolute manner. All evils are privations. And that's sort of like the banner theme of this chapter. All evils are privations. Anything that man perceives as being bad or going wrong or becoming corrupt or destroyed in his world is a result of God withdrawing not a, of a God who proactively is causing this to happen. Now, many might think that the Rambam is trying to explain this in terms of a moral explanation of a moral God. Um, but as I mentioned at the very end of our discussion last week, I believe that the Rambam is more concerned about the nature of God's perfection than he is about the question of how could God, how could a good God do this? Um, it's not so much that God is good, but rather that God is perfect. And evil is a product of imperfection and flaw, and therefore it's more of a scientific analysis of how there, God, through a system of withdrawal or privation, is able to allow evil to exist. And so the Rambam gives examples. With respect to humans, death is an evil, since humans seek life and death is the privation of life. So our illness poverty and ignorance. And notice that the Rambam only talks about death at this point in respect to human beings, that they perceive it as evil. Do we perceive the death of animals as being evil as well? Is that a bad thing? Well, no, we, use, we kill animals all the time for food. Animals kill animals all the time because of the food chain. And so we can't actually attach the word ra to the death of animals, but we're gonna see that in just a minute. And the Rambam then says, only someone who is ignorant of the nature of things does not accept the principle of privation that I have laid out, or is not philosophically sound, only someone who's not philosophically sound can dispute this. And the Rambam uses some technical terminology that we're not uh, from Aristotle that we're not gonna get bogged down to uh, in the second paragraph on page 439. With respect to other existent things other than human beings, however, while one may not assign evil to their deaths or illnesses, we do acknowledge that those states are nonetheless privations of form. In other words, any kind of death, even one that we would not say necessarily is ra, I mean, a person kills a chicken in order to have uh, some chicken soup, that's not necessarily ra, but there's definitely privation there. In other words, the fact that the chicken is no longer a living creature, but is now a dead creature, does not mean that death now is a new attribute created by God that inheres in the chicken, but rather life has been removed from the chicken. After these premises, it is established that God never produces evil as an essential act, that is proactively, as his primary intention to produce evil. Rather, all his acts are in absolute good, for he only produces being, and all being is good. And here the Rambam does say, in other words, there is a coalescence here between perfection and goodness. There's an equation between the two. But again, I don't believe it to be an, a, an argument based on what we would perceive as morality, but based upon the very nature and essence of God. God is incapable of doing anything other than that which we perceive as good. The only way God is connected to privation, however, is that God created matter. 
Now, one can ask a question, if God ultimately is responsible for matter, and as we discussed in last week's discussion, matter by its very nature, by its very nature, is subject to corruption and breakdown, isn't God responsible indirectly for all of the breakdown of things that exist in this world? Matter by its very essence is given to corruption and breakdown. Hence, it is the cause of all passing away and of all evil. Thus, so the Rambam would basically say, yes, God did create matter, but it's an indirect product of the creation of a flawed material existence that things break down, but that's not the primary objective. And thus, anything that is not material is not subject to privation. If we think about all of the celestial existent beings, if we think about all of the disembodied intelligences that exist in the celestial realm, those things are permanent existences because they are not attached in any way to matter, to the material realm. Now, but if God only produces good, how can matter be considered good if it is subject to breakdown? And here the Rambam gives us an added twist. He says that yes, while it's true that God is responsible indirectly for matter, and therefore one could argue that from a certain perspective, God is responsible for evil in the world, but nonetheless, it's not really evil that the fact that matter breaks down. And firstly, the Torah test itself testifies to the fact that everything God created is good because it says, that in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, at the very end of creation, God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. Now, this idea that everything God made is good means that even matter which is subject to corruption is good. How can matter be called good if it is subject to corruption? In what way is matter good? So here the Rambam is sort of, in other words, on the one hand, he started off by saying that it's the fact that matter breaks down is an indirect consequence of God's creation of it. But it still doesn't completely answer the question, why would God create something that is subject to corruption? So the Rambam sort of addresses this by saying, and I'm quoting from the Pines uh, translation, even the existence of inferior matter, whose manner of being is to be always conjoined to death and evil, all this is good in view of the perpetuity of generation and the permanence of being through succession. And what he means essentially is this, we have something, I guess, you know, from the Lion King, the circle of life, the idea being that even that which is within the material realm, which is subject to corruption, death, and breakdown, but it is only to be recycled into the next existent material and formal uh, item. That is to say, a, a, a tree dies in the forest. It, it disintegrates, it decomposes, and it becomes compost in the soil. That gives rise to another tree to grow with the nutrients of the previous tree. The same thing is true with human decomposition, which fertilizes soil and gives rise to new growth. And the same thing that human beings reproduce. And eventually that uh, the, the, the person who was the reproducer eventually passes away, but leaves a child in his or her place. And so you see that even though we uh, are subject to corruption and breakdown, but there's a constant recycling and rejuvenation of the material realm so that no matter is ever permanently lost. And so in that respect, the Rambam says that even matter is good, despite the fact that it is subject to corruption, its corruption only leads to regeneration and rejuvenation. And this is what Rabbi Meir meant when he said in the, in the, in the uh, Midrash, that when the Torah says that God saw that it was very good, the Medrash asks in a couple of places, what I, I understand that what good is, but how can you say that it was very good? What does the word very, ma'od, mean? And Rabbi Meir commented and said that not only was, uh, was all of that which exists permanently, that we perceive to be good, good, but even those things that are acts of corruption and privation, such as death, even death is perceived as good because in the material realm, death leads to new life. And so the Rambam concludes this chapter by saying, 
remember what I have told you, then everything the prophets and sages have said will become clear regarding good being the only essential act of God. The Midrash thus states, Amar Rebbe Chanina, Ein davar yoreid, ein davar ra, yoreid milamala. Nothing ra emanates from up above. So that's the medrash that the Rambam quotes. The only interesting thing is that he doesn't cite the next part of the medrash. Perhaps he means to allude to it. So let me just read for you what the next part of the medrash says. Ativun, so a question was raised. Vahaketiv, does it not say in Psalms, Eish uvarad shelek vikitor? that God is responsible for fire and hail and snow and, uh, and, and, and smoke. So some of those things are not good. Fire and brimstone is not good. Uh, sometimes snow is not good. Hail is not good. It'll destroy the crops. Smoke is not good. It'll help. It'll destroy the agriculture. So how can you say that everything that comes from God is good? So Omar Lahem, Ruach se'arahi shehi osa devaro. He says, ah, but if you look carefully at the verse, it doesn't say that God, this di directly emanates from God, esh uvarad sheleg vikitor, but rather ruach se'ara osa devaro. It is a stormy wind that brings about the fire and the hail and the snow and the smoke. That's what the verse states. It is a, a wind that God allows to emerge that causes these things. In other words, what the Medrash is implying is that only the rain that is good falls from heaven. That rain on its way down gets converted through the material forces of this world, including the, the, the wind that is in the atmosphere, that transforms the good rain into something different because of the privating effect that matter has on God's creation, even those things which are good in form are eventually converted to something less than good. So the Rambam is essentially saying, yes, God is direct is is responsible for the existence of evil, but it, through an act of privation, through a deprivation of the good, not through a direct uh, objective of creating evil, of creating Ra. Now, um, we've for our purposes up until now, we've defined Ra as best as we can. I'm going to revisit this at the end of our discussion today, but let me just then now go into the next chapter, chapter 11. It's a short chapter, and I just want to connect it to chat to what we've just learned. As the Radak stated, we started with in Sefer HaShoroshim, there is no difference between divine evil and human evil. People who inflict evil upon others because of ambition, desire, opinions, and beliefs, all of these inflictions of evil are a result of privation. That even human beings who are capable of evil only do so because of some kind of lack that exists within them. And what is that lack, explains the Rambam? It is a privation of man's intellect, that is, out of ignorance. Human, just as a blind man causes injury to others due to his lack of sight, because let's say a blind man is walking down the street with his cane and he accidentally strikes a person and knocks him to the ground. It wasn't an intentional um, uh, 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 infliction of injury due to a mindful, um, uh, deliberate attempt to cause injury but it was rather due to the blind man's ignorance of the fact that there was another person there. So does an ignorant person cause harm to others because of his small mindedness. In other words, for the Rambam, and this is so important, when a person possesses a perfected intellect without any flaw, without any privation, such a person is incapable of inflicting evil upon others. I don't know whether the word incapable is perhaps too strong, but a person who, is, who has perfect knowledge would recoil from the prospect of inflicting evil upon others. Uh, so to speak, let's say, uh, uh, I have the ability to jump off a building and commit suicide, but I recoil from that prospect because I know that it is something that makes absolutely no sense and is uh, very, very counterproductive to my purpose in being. 
Um, that being the case, I will not do that. If a person had a more perfect intellect, anytime he would be filled with a feeling of jealousy, of, uh, uh, of malice, of a desire to harm someone else for whatever personal gain he hopes to get out of it, a person would be able to stop himself and say that makes absolutely no sense. It is completely counterproductive to any kind of good that should uh, should exist in, in, uh, in, in this realm of existence. And th therefore the Rambam says, if there were knowledge whose relation to the human form is like that of the faculty of sight to the eye, then everyone would refrain from doing any harm to themselves or others. We will elaborate upon this in chapter 12 as far as the different kinds of evil that exist in the world. For through, and this is the reason I, I uh, highlight this or put it in italics is because it's really the sort of the thrust of this idea. For through cognition of truth, enmity and hatred are removed and the inflicting of harm by people on one another is abolished. And the Rambam concludes this chapter by stating that this is the prophet's statement about the messianic future. He is actually citing this from the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 11 says, we know the famous passage, Vigar Ze'ev in Keves, the wolf will lie down with the sheep. The Namer in Gedi Yerbats, the leopard will frolic with the goat. The Egel Uchafir Umri Yachdav in Arkatano Hekbam. Again, there's going to be this sort of new phenomenon of everyone getting along with each other. Ufara Vidov Tir Ena, the cow and the bear will will graze together um the arye kabakar yochal teven and the lion will no longer be a carnivore but will eat straw uh um, and then finally in verse 9 it says lo yareu velo yashchitu bechol har kodshi there will be no evil lo from the word ra velo yashchitu they will no longer destroy or be destructive in my whole mount of holiness why because the world will be filled with the knowledge of God, such an abundant knowledge of God, such a rich and full knowledge of God that it will be like uh, as abundant as the water that covers the earth. Um, through a better knowledge of God, all violence and evil ceases. Now, we know from other writings of the Rambam that when the Rambam looks at this verse in Isaiah, and he talk, which talks about the wolf lying down with the lamb. Uh, it is not a literal statement that anything will change in the nature of, of the animal kingdom. The Rambam had said explicitly that this, will, this, this passage represents the enhanced intellect of humankind, not of the animal kingdom. And it's on that basis that the Rambam cites this passage in reference to the fact that when the human intellects are alleviated of any ignorance and flaw, it is impossible for them to inflict harm upon each other. And as the Rambam writes in Hilchot Melachim chapter 12 at the very beginning, al ya'ale al halev, do not anyone think that anything will change in the natural order of science. Nature will remain as it is. Oh, or something will be innovated in the act in, in the works of creation. Ella Olam Kemin Hagono Heg, rather the world will continue as it always has been. And what about the fact that Isaiah says, keves, im gidi yirbats? What does he mean when he says the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the leopard will frolic with the goat? Mashal Vichida. That's only a metaphor. All it means is that Israel will live in peace with their previous, those who were previously their enemies, who were previously evil, who previously inflicted anti-Semitic persecution and harm and terrorism upon the Israelites. Um, and that is the analogy to the wolf and the leopard, these wild human beings who are ferocious and seek to inflict violence and harm to others and are predatory, that behavior will cease. The Ramam goes on from there and we refer you to that 
to that passage. Take a look at the Ra'avad's gloss on that paragraph as well, who disagrees with the Rambam, but that's not for now. The point being is that the Rambam equates perfect knowledge with peace existing within mankind. So his point being is that even human evil, the choices that human beings make to inflict harm upon each other is a product of privation. Once again, God creates man with the capacity to commit evil. God created human beings with the capacity to perform genocide upon another group of human beings. But does that mean that God is responsible for that evil directly? No, God only indirectly creates things in this world that are subject to evil. And when it comes to the human condition, human beings can exercise free will to choose evil because of the lack of per perfected knowledge that exists within the human condition. Now, I want to, before we conclude for today, I want to add this following postscript. We've, we have a difficult time, I, I certainly, I have a difficult time translating the word Ra and understanding what it really means because it seems to change based on different contexts. You can have Ra referring to natural phenomena that man perceives as being harmful and painful, such as, you know, a terrible um, uh, 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 monsoon that or or hurricane or earthquake that ends up killing a number of people that's one kind of ra another kind of ra are medical uh, conditions that are are no one's fault congenital defects and things like that and another kind of ra is the evil that human beings choose to inflict upon uh, upon others um but i also want to point out that this word ra is quite elusive because what is ra when you think about it, don't we have a principle that kol man da'avid rachmana letav avid, everything that God does is good? Does, didn't the Rambam himself quote the Medrash as saying that anything that emanates from heaven is ultimately good? So is Ra a reality, but just that it's a product of privation, or does it, is it just an illusion? Is it a complete illusion? And this is something I, I just want to point out that first of all, it's important to note that the, that the existence of evil in the world is a theological discussion that has plagued philosophers and theologians for millennia. This discussion and this whole presentation of the Rambam saying that evil is a privation of the good and is not a construct unto itself is something that the Rambam did not invent. It goes back to Plotinus and the Neoplatonic Neo school of philosophy, many, many centuries predating the Rambam. Early Christian theologians had, had struggled with this idea. So Augustine talks about this idea of evil as a privation of good. Boethius in his, uh, in his famous idea of the consolation of, of lady philosophy discusses this idea as well. Um, all of these philosophers predate the Rambam. The Rambam is being consistent with his understanding of the Aristotelian God as being perf perfect and emanating only perfection, uh, and is building upon those philosophers as well. But here's something that I think is really important to go back to. We haven't seen this in a few years, but it is at the very beginning of Moren Vuchim, section 1, chapter 2. And I'm using the Friedlander translation because it's just readily available online so I can cut and paste. But he writes as follows. Some years ago, a learned man asked me a question of great importance. The problem and the solution which we gave in our, in our reply deserve the closest attention. It would at first sight, said the objector, appear from scripture that man was originally intended to be perfectly equal to the rest of the animal creation, which is not endowed with intellect, reason, or power of distinguishing between good and evil. In other words, if we look at the biblical account of uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, which seems to imply that when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it is only then that they acquired intellect. And that's strange, says the questioner, because wouldn't you think that when God first created Adam, he would create him with intellect? And how is it that as a result of a sin, man is enhanced with intellect? Because after all, 
the knowledge of good and evil is something that is a human quality that we would say is a good thing to know the difference between good and evil. How then could that have been granted to man as a product of original sin, which is a bad thing? How could something bad where man disobeys God result in a positive result where man has now a human intellect? Doesn't it seem from the story that before man ate from the tree, he was no different from animals, just working based on instincts? Now the Rambam says, first he shows his contempt for the superficial reading of the text. But then when he gets into the answer, he says, now mark our reply, which was as follows. Collect your thoughts and examine the matter carefully, for it is not to be understood as you at first sight think, but as you will find after due deliberation. Namely, the intellect which was granted to man as the highest endowment was bestowed to him before his disobedience. In other words, man had complete uh, and perfected intellect before he ate from the tree of good and evil. With reference to the gift, the Bible states that man, with, with reference to this gift, the Bible states that man was created in the form of likeness of God. When the Torah says, that God created man in his image, it's clear that God's image was the man's ability to, uh, to, uh, to have intellect. Uh, the, the man, man's cognition is being created in God's image, which is what the Rambam wrote in the very first chapter of Moren Nebuchim. So what happened as a result of eating of the tree of good and evil? Th through the intellect, man distinguishes between true and false, between emet and sheker. This faculty Adam possessed perfectly and completely. The right and the wrong, or the good and the bad, are terms employed in the science of apparent truths, i.e. morals, not in that of necessary truths. In other words, what the Rambam says is that good and bad are terms that are relative to the perception of humanity or of social convention. Truth and falsehood are objective truths. And he gives us an example. If a person were to say, were to note that the heavens are spherical, that there's a certain structure to the heavens, and he were to make a comment about that, would you say that he made a good comment, or would you say he made a true comment? Or conversely, if a person were to say something completely incorrect, like the earth is flat, would that be a false comment, or would that be a bad comment? So the Rambam says, truth and falsehood are objective realities. Good and bad are subjective realities. We say of the one it is true, of the other it is false. Similarly, our language expresses the idea of true and false by the terms emet and sheker, but of the morally right and the morally wrong, we say tov and ra. Thus, it is the function of the intellect to discriminate between the true and the false, a distinction which is applicable to all objects of intellectual perception. And essentially what the Rambam continues, and I encourage you to go ahead and read, reread that entire chapter, section one, chapter two. The idea of Tov and Ra are constructs of a material realm. Truth and false are objective realities, just like two plus two is four. So before Adam sinned, he perceived everything as being true and false, as evil, not being evil that is real, but rather as complete falsehood, as a complete negation of that which is real. And he saw that which we call good as something to be true. Life is truth. Uh, death is falsehood because it's the negation of reality. It's the negation of what is true and real. And so this is very consistent with what the Rambam is telling us here in chapter 11. Um, in chapter 11, the Rambam says that man's perfected intellect does not allow him to choose that which is bad because man no longer views it as ra, but rather views it as falsehood. Now, at the same time, let's remember that when God wrote the Torah, vayar elokim kitov, God saw that it was good. So the very same term good is used by God to describe our terrestrial reality, while at the same time the Rambam is saying that a more correct appellation to uh, our reality would be to say that it is emet, 
that it is true. The reason why the Torah does not call our reality emet versus sheker, but rather tov versus ra, is because our reality is shrouded in confusion. God deliberately wanted man to have a reduced intellectual capacity, that he should be able to appreciate that things are either tov or ra, and not emet and sheker. And so this is perfectly consistent with what we've said all along. The Rambam even alluded to it in chapter 10 as well when he said, human death is ra. Is animal death ra? Is it, is it bad? Well, not necessarily. We kill animals all the time. From the, from the perspective of, let's say, a divine perspective, everything is, nothing is really tov or ra because those are based on how human beings in their, with their limited capacity to intellectualize are able to see reality, okay? And that's the, that is, again, goes to the very, very essence and core of the entire third section of the guide, which is this, to discuss the phenomenon of free will, how man, because of his limited intellectual capacity, sees two roads in front of him, and each one is a viable option for him to choose. He can either choose the good or the bad. Before the sin, however, Adam did not see the world that way. It, there was a dumbing down, so to speak, through his eating of the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge allowed man to see evil instead of seeing sheker, instead of seeing falsehood. Much more to discuss. We gave a, we, we had an entire discussion a few years ago when we talked about that chapter of Rav Chaim Volozhiner's Nefesh HaChaim and Rav, Desler, Rav Desler's elaboration upon that, trying to explain what the Rambam really means over here. But I wanted to present this to you. We haven't completely emerged out of the thicket and have absolute clarity on this topic, but I'm providing us perhaps with a, a roadmap to help us get our heads around this whole theology, this whole theology of evil as a privation, of anything negative as a privation of God's essence. Much more to discuss, but we're going to hold it here for today. We are going to be off next week. I'll be traveling, but we will reconvene with chapter 12, Bezrat Hashem, in two weeks from today. And here's wishing you all a great week. We look forward to seeing you next time. Take care now, everybody.